Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. We want to welcome you into worship on this Easter Sunday morning. I can't think of anything better than us doing than exalting the name of Jesus together this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you here. If this is your first time here at Grace Point or whether you're a regular attender, if sometime this morning, if you would pull out the white card that's in the seat back in front of you, the welcome card, and take a moment to fill that out. We love to not only have a record of your attendance, but we love to know how to be praying for you and celebrating answers to prayer the Lord has blessed you with, praises in your life. Uh, after our gathering this morning, as you exit, the ushers will be there with offering plates, and you can put these white cards in the offering plate. Uh, but we would love to, uh, to be praying with you and praying for you. Well, church, this is a good day. I see you got your Easter clothes on, but you know what? They're stretchable. You can do this. You don't need to be all tight and all, all you know, just proper and all these things. You know, you know it is proper to have freedom in worship. Amen. You know, it, it's proper to give glory to the Lord. Now, now, we do this differently. This is okay. This is good. You, you do this in the way that God has created you. But this morning, I would encourage you, don't just sit back and watch other people praise. You dive in and praise your Jesus with us. Amen. In fact, it's going to be hard to worship Jesus sitting down for a couple of these songs. So would you stand with me? In fact, let's worship Jesus together. Let's do that now.
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let every knee bow down, let every tongue confess, one day is worthy.
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be in church today? Amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, 
Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now, look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. So shall it be. Amen.
Lord Jesus, that is our declaration this morning that you are our king, the king above every other king. Lord, I pray that you would help us not just hear words from, from any man, but we will hear your voice, Jesus, speaking our name today. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Church, I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28. We'll be at verse 1 through 7 together in just a moment. As you're turning there, I've been praying for you and for me that just as the Lord called Mary by name, she went to the tomb, found that it was empty. She went and told the disciples. They came running to check it out. and They didn't know what happened to the body of Jesus. They left. And Mary stayed behind, weeping, looking for the body of Jesus that she may have assumed was stolen, taken. And there she encounters who she thought was a gardener, but it really was Jesus Christ himself. The scripture tells us that, that Jesus called Mary by name and she instantly knew it was Jesus. It's my prayer today that as we look at God's word, that we will not just see a good nugget of truth, but we will hear the Lord call us by name as he speaks to us from his word. Matthew chapter 28, I'll start reading at verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it his appearance was like lightning his clothes were white as snow the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men Matthew 28 verse 5 the angel said to the woman do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified he is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Look at verse 6 one more time. He is not here. He has risen. You know, at this time of year, it's common for us to focus on the events surrounding the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. However, this morning, I want us to take a journey through the pages of Jesus' life and carry with us a bundle of, of imaginary signs that we will post along the way. Signs like the one on the screen that read, He is not here, for He has risen. I want you to go with me in your mind to the moment when Christ was born. Jesus, the one who has always been and always will be, the one who is fully God, and now incarnate Christ is also fully man. Jesus coming to us as a little baby, there in a manger, a feeding trough, we find the Christ child. The creator of all things now laid in utter humility, fragile in the form of a baby, humbled himself for our sake. Today I'd like for you to, to take out one of those signs with me and, and I'd like to mount it on the wall of the stable. He is not here, he has risen. Can you see it friend? Jesus is no longer a baby in the manger He's no longer in that fragile state. He is not here. He has risen. Now I'd like to go to Jesus' lowly life. Jesus lived in poverty. He said of himself that foxes have holes and birds, have, birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. Jesus spent many nights out in the mountains. He lived in poverty. He preached in poverty. He wanted to illustrate a point in a sermon, and apparently he had no coin on him. He asked someone in the crowd for a coin. They gave him one, and, and he preached one of life's lasting messages. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, and give to God what is God's. He had this 
appreciation of poverty. One day, in the midst of, of the giving of gold and silver, he gave a supreme compliment to a widow who put in two small copper coins, a fraction of a penny. Jesus told the disciples that she gave even more than the others because she gave out of her poverty. As I leave the lowliness of his existence on earth, I want to hang another sign over the poverty in which he lived on earth and declare he is not here, he has risen. Then I'd like to turn to the misunderstood ministry of Jesus. He was indeed a misunderstood person. You see, friend, if you're going to live in Christ, you too will be misunderstood. He spoke about another country, but few understood his words. He spoke of his death and resurrection, but few perceived his truth. His own family even thought that he was beside himself, that he was crazy when, he, when they told Jesus that your mother and brothers are outside and Jesus said, who is my brother? Who is my brothers? The religious leaders went further on. They said that Jesus was possessed by a demon. Yet Jesus, in his misunderstood ministry, stayed the course following the will of the Father. Before moving on, I'd like to hang another sign there in the misunderstood ministry of Jesus. He is not here. He has risen. Then I want to move to the area of Jesus' temptation. No man ever suffered temptation directly from the devil like Jesus. It was important for Jesus to meet temptation and all of its ramifications. He must meet all the flaming arrows of Satan. Jesus faced temptation and the attack of the devil in the wilderness. I want to hang a sign there in the wilderness of temptation. He is not here. He has risen. I like to also visit the arena where Jesus was persecuted. I think of how they lied against Jesus. How they misrepresented the facts of Jesus how they misquoted Jesus, how they tried to maneuver him to say something wrong. He was abused physically, abused emotionally, abused spiritually. Without a doubt, he was a man of sorrows. But I'd like to take out another sign and hang it over his earthly persecution. He's no longer here. He has risen. Then I'd like to take a look at the loneliness of Jesus' spiritual life. You know, if you're going to live a spiritual life, you're going to be lonely. There's no way to be deep spiritually without spending a lot of time alone with the Father. Jesus was the most solitary and the most sociable of men that ever lived. He spent more time in solitude and more time in crowds than anyone else. If a person is to give themselves to a holy life, there will be areas of aloneness that many will not understand. One by one, Jesus' followers left him. 500, 120, 12, 3. Then Jesus by himself in the garden. Oh, that the Holy Spirit could stimulate within our hearts a deeper hunger for the things of God. You see, friend, when we hunger for alone time with God, a lot of the lesser things that we make our lowercase g gods, they lose their significance when we are alone with God. Jesus was alone and at times lonely, yes. But I want to hang on a sign on the loneliness of his life that he is not here, he has risen. Then I would go to the tomb, the place where they had laid Jesus I would walk along the road to Emmaus and listen to two disciples share their total dismay at what had happened. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Simon Peter, he got out his fishing nets and cleaned them up and said, I'm going back to fishing. And other disciples said, well, we're going to go too. It was a confusing time for all the disciples and perhaps a disheartening time for Jesus. Hadn't they understood anything? But as we stand at that open, empty tomb, I want to leave the largest sign that I have on it written, He is not here, He has risen. Finally, I'd like to look beyond the silence of the tomb to the region of despair. 
I like to stand in my imagination and watch as he descends into the lower regions. Paul said, he who ascended is he who descended. In my mind, I watch him as he goes down into the depths of despair to the depths of hell. In my mind's eyes, I see hell attempting to grip the Christ of Calvary. I'd like to see Jesus rip the gates of hell off of its hinges. As we leave this region of the damned, I want to hang across the door another sign. He is not here. He has risen. His lordship was questioned by men and evil spirits, but he broke the barriers of all the principalities and all the powers at B. He went past, past Herod and Pilate and Caiaphas, past all the human beings, all the demons. He went past all the powers and principalities between earth and heaven. Up, up he went, past the angels. He took his seat at the right hand of the Father on high. I'd like to hang a sign over all the struggles in which he passed from earth to glory and say he is no longer here in the struggle. He has risen a friend, all of this I share with you today is the glorious truth. But, but if, if this is all there is to it, it doesn't mean much to me here on earth. And it won't mean much to you on earth. If all you and I can do today is declare the truth that he is not here, he has risen, and that is true, it won't mean much to you. You could come into a gathering like this and you could declare, He is risen. He's not here. He's risen. Sing a few songs, go out and have lunch and be on your way, and it not mean much at all. In fact, you and I could declare, He's not here. He's risen, and we could miss the entire point of Easter. We could miss the entire point of the cross, the entire point of the resurrection. He is not here, he has risen, means nothing to you until you can say, he is risen and he is here. You see, friend, Jesus dying on the cross, paying the price for the sin of the world, conquering not only death, sin, but conquering the grave for you and I. The purpose is for us to have a relationship with the Father to be right before God, and Jesus extends a relationship with us. In Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at your heart's door and knock. Anyone who would open the door of their heart and welcome me in, I will come in and eat with them, and they will eat with me. This is relationship language. He says, Not only will I forgive you of your sin, but I want to come in and be the Lord of your life. That's what Easter is all about. That's where the power is that he's not here, he is risen. And then the declaration to say he is risen and he is here comes from. I want to invite you now to bow your head and close your eyes. If closing your eyes makes you feel uncomfortable, just stare at your shoes. The point is to not be distracted by anything else going on. I want to invite you to to pray this prayer with me. If you would like to have relationship with God, if you want to be able to celebrate Easter and be able to say he is risen and he is here in my life, if you'd like to know for sure where you will spend eternity in heaven, then this is the invitation the Lord gives to you. As I pray this salvation prayer aloud, I invite you in your mind, in your heart, to pray this silently with me. Lord Jesus, I know there's things that I've said and done that are wrong. I recognize those things are sin and they separate me from you. I want to ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to turn from it. And with your help, Jesus, I want to live and obedience to your way the rest of my days. Thank you for saving me now. Amen. I had an opportunity to pray that prayer a couple of months ago with, with a woman. And then, and not that long ago, we were talking about that moment when she prayed that prayer. And, and she shared with me, she said, I hope that was enough. 
I hope I, hope I said it in a way that, that he'd forgive me. And so we opened up the Bible to Romans 10, 9, and we saw the rock solid confidence that anyone who confesses with their mouth, believes in their heart that he's risen from the dead, they will be saved. Not just believe here, but put my weight and trust on Jesus. They, not sometimes, most likely, depending on their pedigree, hopefully on Monday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, no, all the time, whosoever will, they will be saved. You see, friend, that's the personal relationship that Jesus offers to us through his death and resurrection. Jesus made it possible for us to be right before God, to be righteous, to be in right relationship with him. This is a very personal thing. Not, not that it's private, not that it's secret, but it's very personal. You see, friend, Jesus died for you. He died for me. He conquered sin, death, and the grave for you. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, and you meant that in your heart, you have biblical evidence. God's word says that you are saved. And this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. You see, it's one thing for Mary to find the tomb empty. It's another thing for her to hear Jesus call her by name. Not just on the day of conversion when we accept Jesus. Is it good to hear him call our name? But every day of our life, he calls out to us by name. I believe that there's many of you here today who have accepted Jesus before this Easter morning. Many of you have invited Jesus into your heart, into your life, to lead your life. And on this Easter, I encourage you, don't just declare, he's not here, he's risen. That's true, declare that. But also declare from the depths of your heart, he is risen and he is here. You see, this one who resides in you he is the victor of that fragile manger. You'll find yourself in fragile, tender moments in your life. He has victory over that. He is the victor over the lowly and poverty-stricken places in this world. Ever feel like you've got nothing? Jesus is the victor over that. He is the victor over the misunderstood. He's the victor over all temptation. He's the victor over all persecution and suffering. He's the victor over loneliness. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he has walked where you are walking. He has already conquered the enemy that is before you today. And he now walks with you. You see, he is risen and he is here. The very spirit of Christ, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in you. Jesus said, it's better for me to go away that my spirit may be in you and now lives with you. You see, friend, here is the hope. Here is the victory. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear can be gone. Because you know he holds the future, life is worth living just because he lives. Amen. Because he
The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ shines as the ultimate proof of our God's sovereignty. His purpose was perfectly fulfilled in spite of the most evil and despicable plans of sinners and even Satan himself. The worst deed that hell and human depravity could design because of God's absolute authority was used to bring about the greatest good of all time. And so our hearts rejoice. that paid my way death its price when it flowed down from the cross my sins for God my sins for God there is a grave that tries to hide this precious blood that gave me life in three days he breathed again and rose
person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The Spirit and the Bride say come, and let the one who hears say come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten times, thousand times, ten thousand. And in a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Come on, church, lift them up. Spirit moves and breathes. 
glory to Jesus. It was one thing for Mary to go and find the tomb empty, but it was quite another thing for her to hear Jesus call her by name. It's one thing to say, he's not here, he's risen. And it's a whole other thing to say, he is risen and he is here. It's my prayer today that you won't just hear Jesus call you by name on the, the day of your conversion when you accept Jesus into your life. But every single morning, he's promised, I will not leave you or forsake you. I am with you. And to be able to declare, Jesus, you are alive and you are here with me. Church, would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the hope that we have in you. That while we were still shaking our fist in rebellious sin at you, you died for us. Who are we that you would even be mindful of us? Yet you not only pay the price of our sin, you free us from the chains of sin, but you invite us into this life relationship with you. Lord, I pray today that you will stir in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl who knows you today the declaration that you are alive and that you are here in their heart. Lord, would you pour out your boldness that we may speak of you to every person who would listen of the difference you've made in our life. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen and amen. Well, church, it's been so good worshiping Jesus with you. If you filled out a white card, whether you're a regular attender or this is your first time here, if you wouldn't mind, put that in the offering plate. The ushers will have that at the exits. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Go tell everybody who will listen and a few who won't listen that your Jesus is alive and he's in you. You're dismissed.